This is the valley, a vanished world from a forgotten time. Here on the Welsh borders, a farm is being run by five hand-picked experts as it would have been nearly 400 years ago. Using only resources available in the year 1620, they are laboring for a full calendar year, turning the clock back to rediscover a way of life from an age gone by. It's February now, it's our sixth month on the farm and we're halfway through the agricultural year. It's a very austere time 400 years ago. It was the start of Lent when you were only allowed to eat fish and dairy produce and not flesh. We've got a lot of work to get through this month as usual. We've got to get the sheep overhauled so they're in good condition before lambing next month. But there is one job that's a lot more urgent than all the rest. The privy has developed a severe list in the last gale. And if we're not careful, one dark night, it's going to be down round our ears. Rebuilding the privy is this month's challenge for Alex and Fonz. First and foremost, it's a bit of a structural hazard. You can see it's leaning here. It hasn't been braced properly when it was first built, so the wind's just blown it over slightly, and we've got to pop it up on this side. Another concern is this seat. It's, um, I think, Fonzie, you've had a few problems. It's a given that this plank is going to break, and I don't want to be the one on it when it breaks. <laughs> the final concern is that uh, it's becoming a bit of a biological hazard. The original pit that was dug, um, I don't think it was dug deep enough, and we find that we're filling it up really quickly. So another task to dig a deeper hole. OK, Stuart. Well, yeah, if we gonna... get that round the other side and shove with it, you right, ready? You want to, you want to, do you want to take get... it out? We think it's going to fall. Careful, 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 careful. I think it should be all right. It may be, but... It's going a bit. No, OK, it's back okay. off. <laughs> right, OK. Let's get round the other side and push it down. So what are we going to do? We're just going to give it a big... Well, if you go on the back corner, on the upright... On the back one, yeah? I'll see if I can get this up the inside. If you take that corner, Fonz, and we'll see how much strength it's got left in it. OK, what are we going to go? On, on four? Can't count that far. Let's go for three. <laughs> one, one, two, two three. three. Ah! Well, that's really in it. <laughs> right, now we can start taking it apart. Yep, strip it down. With the cold of February upon the valley, Chloe is paying special attention to the farm's two young ponies. She's hoping to train them up as working farm horses. We're losing all the grass out in the big field and there's a lot of stock out there. So um, to feed them on their own out there would be a, a bit silly because they wouldn't really get a look, a look into any hay we put out because all the other stock would just get straight to it. So bring them into the yard, throw a bit on the floor and see what they eat. They're doing really well actually, considering about two months ago these two were pretty much wild. Um, obviously we've made a bit of a difference here. If I can actually get my skirt back. <laughs> This one, certainly, I got, she kicked me two months ago really hard. And I think now we're, we're a bit of a change pony. I'm not quite sure why she's so keen on my skirt. One of the key agricultural landmarks is looming, spring sowing. So Stuart and his son Alistair need to get the pea seed ready for planting. We harvested the peas on the vine. Uh, that we were going to use for seed earlier this year. And now we've got the time, set a bit of sunshine, good light, and gently pod our way through. The waste stalks and pods, called the pea horn, quickly become a snack for the horses. This is the sort of job that any member of the household might have done, although quite often one can get the children to get the bulk of it sorted. It gives you a bit of a rest, though, and... Uh, at this time of year, that means you can start to get a bit chilled. So in a few minutes, I think we're going to have to go off and do something a bit more active. Stuart, can you give me a hand with the hay? Yep. Oh. I'll just lose this stuff into the yard, I think. How much do you need? Um, armful. Right. About the same as what's on the floor would be good. Up above the stables, the levels of hay in the loft are slowly being depleted by winter feeding. Out on the privy, it's time for Alex and Fonz to remove the old rotten floorboards and really start getting their hands dirty. It's unfortunate for Fonzie, he, um, 
he lost at Hazard the other night, which is a dice game we play. As a consequence, um, he's got the uh, onerous task of digging out the cesspit. It was fixed. <laughs> the, di the, di <laughs> the dice were loaded in my favour. 400 years ago, human faeces was a vital fertiliser. In cities, specialist contractors called night soilmen emptied privies and took the waste out of town for processing. Have you got your tool? I made this yesterday. Beautiful. A special present to Fonzie, his scoop. So there you go, mate. This job can only be described as grim, but it's a job that had to be done, and shit was actually very valuable. It was used for uh, compost mixed with uh, wood ash. You can't put it straight on the top of the field, you've got to dig it down. And you can't plant root vegetables in it in the first year. Only vegetables that grow above ground, such as kale or cabbage. But the second year, it's brilliant for root vegetables. How's your scoop working? It's heavy. Yeah? But not as heavy as the spade. But it's working well. It's working very well. It wasn't just human feces that had value. Like any 17th century farmer's wife, Ruth has to take extra care of another waste product. Almost nothing went to waste in a farm like this. Even our urine has a value and a use. Of course, at night, getting to the privy out here is almost impossible. It's pitch black, you'd be stumbling all over the place. So we use piss pots um, up in the bedroom, just like they would have done. And then in the morning, I have to come out here and empty it. Being useful, I keep it separate and store it in a jar by the privy. How's it going, Fonz? We're getting close. We're almost there. Oh, yeah, it looks a bit better, doesn't it? Urine on a farm is really mostly used for making um, ammonia bleach for laundry. Really, you only just have to leave it for about three weeks and stale urine becomes ammonia. It's a really useful chemical. And of course, in towns, it was actively collected on a sort of industrial scale. So there were people whose job it was to go round and collect piss pots that were stood outside of pubs, which hopefully everybody contributed to. Um, and they would take them away and then start using them in a whole range of industrial processes, including the making of saltpetre, which, of course, is one of the most important ingredients for gunpowder, a really burgeoning industry at the time. Waste management 400 years ago was a sort of fairly large business, really, extending all over the place. There was money in money. Temperatures have been dropping in the valley, and for the very first time in the team's year on the farm, snow is falling. Despite the turn in the weather, Stuart, Ruth and Chloe need to bring the sheep in for essential maintenance. Sheep really evolved to live up on high mountains in dry areas so firstly, because there's no rocks to wear away their toenails, they tend to get ingrowing toenails. So we've got to trim those every now and again. The other thing that we've got a big problem with at the moment is that we've just had a few warm days. There's a lot of fresh grass coming through. And as a result of that, they've developed severe diarrhea and they've got really claggy backsides. So what we've got to do is cut all this dangling crud off the back end of them and then look for sores and treat that appropriately if there's a problem there. Getting a bit better at this uh, sheep herding. <laughs> of course, in the period, although they had sheep dogs, period sheep dogs were only used for driving the sheep. Um, and they hadn't yet developed a system of, of sort of training the dogs to do that going round thing. So many shepherds carried a, a sort of a scoop on the end of the stick so they could like pick up a little bit of something and then fling it over the far side of the herd. And that would turn them. <laughs> <laughs> I do quite like the sheep actually, they're, um, they're quite easy to herd compared to the pigs and the cows so uh, I'm quite fond of them in that respect and they've all got their individual characters. We've got, uh, we've got Monty, who's, he's the only ram and um, he's, he likes to think he's boss but really like as you get in every household he's not, it's the women that are in charge. And we've got these sort of eight year old ewes that they really know their stuff and they're boss. There we go. Well done. A new day and the snow has settled, turning the valley into a winter wonderland.
but the serious business of looking after the livestock has to go on. Particularly Duchess, who is eight months pregnant. Come on. With the sheep in from the fields, Stuart, Ruth and Chloe can give them a proper going over. Gently does it. You're gonna need a hand. Yeah, just stop bolting that way. Right. Gotcha. <laughs> right. Oh, that was easier than I expected. Oh, she's a bit soggy <laughs> with this snow. Beast, come on, girly. Oh, come no, on, in you come. Nothing much wrong with this one. <laughs> right, these are Cotswolds. They go right back to Roman times. And they're kept because there's really long fur that they've got. But they're not particularly good mountain sheep. So you've got to give them a lot of attention. Right, girl. <laughs> Mind you, the pictures you see of these oh. sheep. <laughs> <laughs> come here. All right. On your back. That's oh, it. Oh, here we go. Right. Let's get you cleaned up. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Cotswold. It's got this very distinctive forelock and a very long staple, very long thread to the wool. And you can find statues up on the Cotswolds from Roman times which show exactly that shape of fur on the head. They do, but they so, usually look a bit smaller when you see pictures, <laughs> isn't it? When you see period pictures. They've been bred over the years, that, yes. In the period, the, the, the sheep, the same breed, but nonetheless was actually physically smaller, which may, would have made this sort of handling a lot easier than these great huge lumps. <laughs> They're now known as Cotswold lions because of the size and look of them. Yeah, I know, dear, I know. You'll get about a £10 fleece off a Cotswold. A modern sort of Welsh mountain sheep, you might be looking at about £3. So, a lot of wool for your money on these. The, the shears are actually, as long as they're start sharp, they're really easy to do. Um, the ones Ruth's using are actually very, they're razor sharp, actually. I only cut myself sharp them earlier. Just a bit there, that's your tail, isn't it? I'm going to check her feet as well while I'm here, just to make sure... She hasn't got any cuts or problems there. That one's all right. Chloe, have you got that Stockholm tar? It's the thing most frequently recommended in um, period sources. So this will act just as a like of an antiseptic and sort of seal up any cuts. There we go. Come on then, you. Before you do anything nasty. Oh gosh, she's wobbly already. There we are. Just give her a minute. With these large breeds, if you have them on their backs for too long, all the internal organs have flopped over the wrong way and they crush down and it starts to cause them severe problems inside. So the last thing that I need to do with her, now that we've done her feet and dagged her tail, I'm going to do standing up. Right. <laughs> What's I've only got little legs. <laughs> Come here, you rat bag. How much is this worth, Stuart? Wow. What I'm going to do is have a look at your gums because one of the diagnostics that you get in the period books is if the gums are white, we've got a problem, but those are beautifully pink. They See are. that? How are those teeth doing? They're in fairly good shape for you of your age. Right. Okay, there you go. Good girl. Okay, who's next? The cesspit has been dug out and enlarged. Now Fonz and Alex can get on with the privy superstructure. The problem, obviously, with the snow. It's rained on my timbers, and what I'd done is I'd prefabbed the structure for the privy, and in fact, I think this one should be on that side. It should. To help keep the wall plates in position, they'll also need to be mortared in. Now, this is a piece of ash, so it's actually really quite light, this one. This way around? Yeah. What I've done is, is just cut really simple mortars and tenon joints. So it just you've got a, like a sort of peg which just keys into a hole. And um, because they're quite broad and it's quite deep, that's managing actually just to stand up on its own for now. And then of course there's mortars and tenon joints up there as well. You in? There? Yeah. So give it a tug. Stonehenge. Woodhenge. <laughs> gotcha. There we go. These purebred Cotswold sheep, there's only about a thousand of them left in existence. It's very close to the sort of sheep medieval times being the core of our woolen industry. There are even more primitive sheep, like the Soe. Oh. <laughs> You're not going anywhere, girl. <laughs> okay, have a look at her feet oh while I hold her. Goodness, <laughs> <so bad. laughs> but 
things like the Soe have only survived out on primitive islands because nobody bothered with them. So this is the cultivated sheep that we would have bothered farming, not these scrawny little deer like things. Don't you look at me like that girl. Is somebody going to deal with her backside? <laughs> Am I sitting here all day in the no, snow? No, <laughs> Come on, old girl. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's no problem, it's just a great fluffy ball. <laughs> we've known each other a long time, haven't we, girl? <laughs> now, all the ones we've cleared up so far, there's plenty of flesh on there, they're getting plenty to eat at the moment. It's all the hay we've been feeding them out of the lofts. So, they're in fairly good sheep, uh, shape for... Sheep shape? Ship shape? <laughs> now this... The temperature in the valley has dropped to about minus four. Working without modern waterproofs, the team have to keep busy outside just to keep warm. Here we go. That's good. Right, only the walls and the uh, the roof to do now. Oh, apart from the toilet seat, of course. Certainly very grand for a toilet. <laughs> Excellent. All right, I think it's time to uh, pack Have a up. Beer. And head for the uh, head for the fire in the hall. To help thaw out our team, period music specialist Trevor James has come along with an assortment of 17th century instruments for them to try out, like this sitan. You're supposed to use a feather, really. Feather. Yes. <laughs> I've, used a, I've used a plectrum before. One of the plectrums yeah. would be a little feather. That's, that's clearly a feather. <laughs> a feather plectrum. Let's give it a try. The English bagpipe was uh, very popular in this period. Uh, it was in popular right the way through the, the medieval period. I mean, Henry VIII, for example, had um, an actual bagpipe band at court. <laughs> I think there was about 40 of them. Um, but he was the, sort of the last monarch to, to have bagpipes at court, and then gradually they sort of dropped down the social scales. I mean, on a farm like this, uh, in this particular period, um, the bagpipes would certainly have been played and uh, little things like the pipe and tabor even, the, the one-man band of the period. And it's played with the tabor pipe, surprisingly, or to give it its other name, the three-hole pipe. So if I cover all the holes and blow at four different breath pressures, we'll actually end up with four different notes. So... Oh, wow. The thing about the music of the period is people tend to think of it as a very courtly sort of music, very dainty, very steppy, if you like. But in fact, in an environment like this, it would be quite raucous and, and very lively and, and lots of drinking and, and having a damn good time. And talking of rustic, I've got one more little gem for you, Chloe. Me. <laughs> yes. No, that's a walking stick, that's not an instrument. Yes, <laughs> it's a snorkel. All oh, right, and I can play that. I think you can, yes. This is a crumb horn. The curvature doesn't have any effect upon the sound that the instrument produces at all, but it's really like the saxophone. It projects the sound forward, but it has a beautifully raucous sound. Oh. <laughs> that sounds like a good scene. Try that one. Okay. Uh, 
that shit. <laughs> Pardon me. Oh, the cows so the, will so love so you in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm squeaking. Yes, you are. <laughs> and you're doing it very well. Oh, go on, yeah. go on, go for it, Bond. Somebody oh, else God. just... Bond's Oh, I feel such a fool. <laughs> well, sorry, Fonzie, if you can't do that, I've got these for you. Marvellous. I can't quite need those. <laughs> There's a snake coming out the jug. <laughs> After several days, the February snow is finally melting in the valley. Time for Fonz and Alex to install the toilet seat. Rather than period authenticity, here they've made something with comfort in mind. Okay, Fonz, on with the box, the splash guard. It's time for the business end of things now, putting our toilet structure in. That sits quite nicely. Just see how smoothly it sits on some of these, these floorboards. On with so the lid. There we go. That's central. Um, a little bit to you at the right, at the back. Um, yeah, that's that's good. And a lift, there we are. A nice clean drop. Some five, six feet. In fact, look, Fonz, we've got some uh, got some water building up there. And we've got our, our own self-flushing toilet. Well, I suppose we should, um, should check it out to see if it's sturdy enough. Oh, there we go. It's certainly, uh, certainly comfy enough. Yeah, it's got a bit of a, a got a bit of a backrest thing going here as well. That's quite nice. You look very regal. <laughs> regal, looking out over the garden. I'm still not convinced about the size of this hole, though, Fonz. It tends to uh, pinch somewhat. You ought to give it a go, mate. In all, it's taken ten days to rebuild the valley's privy. Now they just need to finish the roof. In the 1600s, February would have been a very lean time. Little grows in the garden and most farm animals are pregnant, so fresh meat is off the menu. All of which makes it highly appropriate that this marks the beginning of Lent, 40 days of culinary restraint. The church's very own Lenten period of abstinence is exactly that point in the year when an ordinary farming family hasn't got any choice anyway. But fish, in all its preserved ways, are available right through the year. These ones are smoked, you can have them salted or pickled, obviously, as well. And it's sea fish, it's not freshwater fish for ordinary common people. Because in order to have freshwater fish, you've got to have the rights to the fishing in the streams and rivers and lakes. And frankly, that was wealthy people only. Queen Elizabeth was determined to increase the number of fishermen because she needed sailors. She needed trained sailors to defend the country, initially, well, obviously, against the Armada and other such threats. And uh, she had no money to pay anybody. So she came up with this marvellous wheeze of having extra fish days in the week, so that instead of just being Friday, it was also supposed to be Wednesday and Saturday. So there'd be a huge market for fish, which would mean we'd have more fishermen and therefore, automatically, all these trained sailors. On the menu for tonight is a fish salad. I'm just easing the skin off. Do we not eat the skin? Mm. Look, look, look how tough it is. Look. Well, you can eat it. Do they but use that for anything? There's some talk, um, or at least they say they found some archaeologically, of uh, condoms made out of fish skin. <laughs> I'm not fancying trying it. No way. Ooh. Nice. <laughs> The privy is now ready for its finishing touches, tidying up the thatch and smearing the last of the daub onto the 17th century style wattle walls. You'd think with all the, uh, with all the thatching that I'd done on the cow shed and the bracken thatching I'd done on the hovel, that I'd have got a bit better at this, but I've actually found with this building, because it's so small, it's been really, really fiddly. I'm just going along with the the mallet here, it's just a stubble thatch again, so it doesn't have to look pretty, it's just got to be functional really. Indoors, the winter warmer dish is apple pudding. 400 years ago, boil-in-the-bag puds using a pudding cloth were a new culinary creation. Things like spotted dick and Christmas pudding are all deriv modern derivations of this technique that was first sort of 
um, made popular and discovered, really, at the very, very beginning of the 17th century. There's a marvellous account by a French traveller visiting Britain. One of the things he said was, to come in pudding time was to come in the best of times. Just pull that in there. Are you? <sighs> I'm going to dress this salad with samphire, uh, which is a salt marsh plant. And inland, of course, you'd have to have it pickled in order to keep it. It goes rather nice with the, with the sort of smokedness of the fish. And I'm going to put the salad right in the centre in a sort of big mountain or hill. Just pop these last few little bits on just to make it look nice. And there we go. One red herring salad. <laughs> I'm going to... Are you getting on all right with those puddings? I'm nearly finished. Fantastic. Just tying them up. Tying them up. You're going to just the puddings them. need about two hours of cooking in a cauldron of boiling water. That's pretty much finished. It's as good as I'll get it. When I first started on the farm about, what, about six months ago, uh, I didn't think I'd be digging out old privies and doing so much construction work. But it's, it's been fun, and I think we've done really well. It's taken a lot of time, this has, but it's, um, it's been a really a rewarding job. Um, it's a, a showpiece of all our, all our skills, and yeah, it's been, it's been really enjoyable. Dead chuffed with this project, dead chuffed. A few fish are left over after the salad, so Ruth is frying them in a preheated pan. Before dinner is served, Stuart makes a dash outside into a cold, dark February night, weaving his way across the vegetable garden to christen the valley's new toilet facilities. Well, at least I haven't got any splinters yet. This seat seems to have been smoothed down well, but I hope he's done a good job on the floorboards. There was a case 400 years ago where a nine-year-old went off to the privy and the floorboards are rotted and he was straight in there, drowned before they got him out. 400 years ago they didn't have purpose-made soft toilet paper to use, but neither were they having to resort to cabbage leaves. The publishers were churning out pulp fiction. There was joke books and romantic tales, real Mills and Boone stuff. And as one wag put it, it was but bum fodder fit to wipe the nation's arse though with. Meanwhile, the fish supper is ready to eat. I like some fire. Thank you very much. Do you want to try a bit, do you? Yeah, can I just steal a little bit of yours? Literally just a, a, a little meaty bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The valley team are now exactly halfway through their year on the farm. They've weathered the worst of the winter. But spring will bring new challenges and new workloads. Next time in the valley, it's March. The pigs get the better of the boys. Round one for the pigs. The wheat gets a good threshing. And it's time for some period fun and games. Surprise! Surprise!